This is the third of a five lecture series on the land battles of Guadalcanal that started with the invasion of Tulagi. The last lecture, part two, was about the invasion of Guadalcanal and the first battle in which the Japanese tried to retake Henderson Field, the Battle of the Teneru. This lecture continues with the subsequent attempts by the Japanese to retake Henderson Field. In my opinion, the icon battle of Guadalcanal was the Battle of Bloody Ridge, also known as Edson's Ridge. This is a view of the ridge in 1942 looking mostly north. These are the three Japanese commanding officers who took part in the Battle of Bloody Ridge. Colonel Oka commanded a battalion of the 124th Regiment. General Kawaguchi commanded a reinforced brigade of the 35th Infantry and Major Mizuno commanded the remnant of the Achiki Detachment, its second echelon. Commanding the 1st Raider Battalion at Bloody Ridge was Colonel Merritt Mike Edson. On August 29th, five Japanese destroyers disembarked 750 troops at Taivu Point, including 300 from Achiki's second echelon named the Kumu Detachment. The next day, an additional 700 troops from Achiki's echelon were disembarked where they established a bivouac. Between August 31st and September 4th, three battalions of Kawaguchi's brigade landed east of the perimeter at Taivu Point. During the night of September 4th and 5th, Colonel Oka landed west of the Matanikau with about a thousand troops of the 124th Infantry from barges. Kawaguchi had five battalions poised to hit the perimeter from three directions. Oka's men, comprising the left wing, would hit the perimeter from the southwest. The remnant of the Achiki detachment, comprising the right wing, would punch through the perimeter and push north to annihilate the Marines at Alligator Creek. Kawaguchi himself, his three battalions of 2,500 troops comprising the center wing, would swing down into the jungle from the east and storm the Marine position from the south to seize the airfield. The Japanese plan was overly complicated and was too dependent on perfect timing of the three forces hitting the perimeter at the same time. To bolster his defenses around the airstrip, on September 4th, General Vandegrift ordered the Raiders, the 2nd Battalion 5th Marines, and the Parachute Battalion to Guadalcanal from Tulagi. He ordered the other two Raider companies to Guadalcanal, but only after making a reconnaissance of Savo Island, where it was reported there were Japanese. After a 12-hour search, the Raiders found no Japanese on Savo and reboarded the destroyer transports Gregory and Little for the trip to Guadalcanal on September 5th. When Edson and the raiders arrived on Guadalcanal, he was ordered to spend the night aboard the transports for another mission the next morning. Through miscommunication, they did not receive this order and disembarked. The Gregory and the Little loitered offshore, ready to re-embark the raiders the next morning. That night, three Japanese destroyers came down the slot to shell Henderson. A flare revealed the Gregory and the Little. At 0115, Japanese searchlights illuminated them and soon found the range, eventually sinking both. The raiders had been lucky. One can only speculate how the Battle of Bloody Ridge would have turned out had the raiders spent the night aboard the two doomed destroyers. Through various indigenous sources, including Martin Clemens and his Solomon scouts, General Vandegrift learned of the Japanese buildup near Taivu Point. They seemed concentrated near Tazimboko, a deserted village on the coast 18 miles east of the Marine perimeter. Colonel Edson and the 1st Marine Division's operations officer, Colonel Thomas, hatched a plan to send the Raider Battalion to Taivu Point behind the Japanese lines to make a reconnaissance to determine how many Japanese were there. At 1830 on September 7th, the 1st Raider Battalion and the 1st Parachute Battalion departed on two transports from the perimeter to scout the Tazimboko area. 
They arrived under cover of darkness at 0530 the next morning. As soon as they got ashore, they discovered signs of a recent Japanese landing, but no Japanese. Edson deployed three of his companies to head west to the village of Tazimboko, while the third stayed behind to defend the embarkation point. At 2200, the advancing companies made contact with about 300 Japanese. A brief firefight ensued, but most of the Japanese fled into the jungle. Those who stayed and fought fired a 37mm anti-tank gun at the Marines at point-blank range, killing two Marines. Edson called for an airstrike. P-400 Arakoba soon arrived and strafed the Japanese holed up in the village. The raiders then entered Tazimboko and found it deserted. Under careful camouflage, they discovered four 75mm guns, ammunition, food, medical supplies, and a large radio. They also found several documents, which they gathered to take back to the perimeter with them. They then set about destroying all the food and ammunition, since they could not take it with them. This very successful raid cost the Marines two killed in action and six wounded. The exultant Marines reboarded their transports, their pockets bulging with tins of crab and sliced beef. Additionally, 21 cases of beer and 8 gallons of sake found their way aboard the transports. The most important intelligence they gathered from this raid was the discovery of a significant Japanese presence in the jungle whose only mission could be another attempt at retaking Henderson Field. When Edson returned to the perimeter, he reported to General Vandegrift that this was not a motley of Japs. Based on what he found, he estimated that there were 4,000 Japanese in the area. Translations of the Japanese documents confirm this. Martin Clemens and his scouts reported Japanese columns moving south and southwest of Tatera Beach. By September 9th, Colonel Thomas knew the Japanese were coming again, but the question was, from where? Here is an aerial photo of Bloody Ridge in 1942 and today with hills 1 and 2 labeled. As you can see, the jungle crept right up to the bottom of the hills during the war, but has been cleared today. Here is a closer view of Bloody Ridge. Note that south is up. Colonel Edson looked at this photo and drew a finger along the ridge from south to north, indicating where he thought the Japanese would hit the perimeter. His finger traced a broken grassy ridge barely a mile south of the airfield. Along each side of the ridge protruded spurs, like legs, which prompted the Japanese to name the ridge Centipede. General Vandegrift disagreed and thought the Japanese would come along the beach, as Colonel Ichiki had in the August action. He was so convinced that the Japanese would never come through what he thought was an impenetrable jungle that he decided to move his command post from near the end of the runway to the grass-covered hills south of the runway. Edson pointed to the ridge where Vandegrift wanted to move his CP and said, If I were the Japs, this would be my line of approach. Vandegrift would not be convinced and held to his view as to the direction of the expected attack along the coast. Despite strong urging from both Colonel Thomas and Colonel Edson, Vandegrift moved his command post from what was known as Impact Center near the airstrip because of the many Japanese bombs that fell nearby to the ridge. He wanted to go to a quieter spot. The relocation of Vandegrift's command post alarmed Colonel Thomas, who realized that if the Japanese did attack the ridge, as he suspected, the new headquarters would be in front of the line not tucked safely behind it. The ensuing discussion resulted in much profanity and a table-thumping argument from Vandergriff, but he prevailed and moved his command post to the ridge. The two-star flag representing General Vandergriff's new command post is located on the left side in the middle of the ridge. To address their concern for Vandergriff's safety so near the spot where they expected the Japanese to come, Thomas and Edson concocted a story. They told Vandegrift that the raiders and the parachute battalions were tired. They had fought a tough battle at Tulagi, had reconnoitered Savo, and had just completed the Tazimboko raid. 
they should be allowed to go to a rest area. They convinced Vandegrift to let them move the raiders and parachutists to the grassy ridge behind the new command post. Vandegrift relented, and on September 11th, the raiders and parachutists moved to the rest area. The next day, the Japanese attacked, and the rest area became known as Bloody Ridge. Decades after the war, raider vets still referred to Bloody Ridge as the rest area. Edson arrayed his men on both sides of the southern end of the ridge. They dug firing positions and laid barbed wire. B Company of the Parachutists was at the front left position of the ridge tied in with B Company of the Raiders on the right front of the ridge. They in turn were tied in with C Company of the Raiders who held the line through the jungle to the Lunga River. Edson had his command post located on Hill 2. The 2nd Battalion, 5th Marines, was held in reserve behind Vandegrift's command post. The most important element of the battle was a battery of 105mm howitzers of the 11th Marines whose guns were oriented to fire on the ridge just in front of the Marine lines. They would play a pivotal role during the second night of the battle. This is where the Japanese were expected to come from. All was in readiness. The Marines did not have long to wait. Here is a photo of the ridge in 1942 looking mostly north toward Hill 2 from Hill 1. Here is a photo of the ridge today looking mostly south. The jungle has been cut back from the base of the hills. This is the location of the hills that comprise Bloody Ridge. This is Kawaguchi's line of approach through the jungle. Colonel Oka was to hit the marine perimeter on the left, but failed to do so. The second echelon of the Achiki detachment, the Kuma force, was to hit the perimeter from the right. They missed the action during the night of September 12th, but were beaten back on the 13th. Kawaguchi's main thrust from the jungle hit the center on the night of September 12th. This was the raider defensive disposition as evening approached on September 12th. The Marines numbered about 850 men. They barely had time to string barbed wire across the front and to dig foxholes on the forward slope of the hills. Edson set the boundary line down the long axis of the ridge with the parachutists to the east and the raiders to the west. Company B of the parachutists hugged the eastern side of the southern end of the ridge, Companies C and A were located further back to the east of Hill 2. B Company of the Raiders lapped over the western edge of the ridge before plunging into the jungle. To the right of B Company, C Company extended the line to the Lunga River. C Company's line was bisected by a swamp. One platoon sat east of the swamp tied in with B Company. The other two platoons held the front to the Lunga River. Edson disposed companies A, D, and E, the weapons company, of the raiders along the west side of the ridge abreast the high knoll at its midpoint. Edson placed his command post behind the parachutist. Here is a photo of the Marines dug in on the forward slope of Hill 1. Note the barbed wire in front of the foxholes. Also note the sandbags that reinforce the front of the foxholes. The Japanese came in from the east at 2130, pivoted north and hit the marine lines on the left side of the ridge. Because the Kawaguchi detachment was scattered along the lone path through the jungle, his men did not arrive at the same time and were fed into the battle piecemeal. Even before the attack began, Kawaguchi had lost control over the battle. Instead of attacking with a telling blow, only a small portion of his men was in position for the first attack. They hit C Company of the Raiders in the jungle and successfully pierced their lines. The Marines of C Company were overrun and cut off by the jungle-hidden Japanese. Captain John Sweeney commanded B Company of the Raiders on the right front of the ridge. They were not attacked and fired no shots that night. He later explained that they had no targets and kept their fire discipline so as not to give away their position. This was even though all hell had broken out next door at C Company. 
The Japanese success was limited and merely confirmed the direction that the Marines expected them to attack from. The survivors of C Company pulled back toward the ridge. Six C Company raiders are still MIA, thought to be in the swamp or, more likely, washed out to sea. The next night when the Japanese attacked in greater numbers, the Marines were ready. They knew where and when the attack would come. The next day, Edson shortened his lines by pulling back the raiders and the parachutists 200 yards to each side of Hill 2. He also had the 12 105mm howitzers of the 11th Marines turned to fire on the ridge. They had previously ranged their guns just forward of the Marine positions on Hill 2. The Division Reserve, 2nd Battalion, 5th Marines, moved to a position south of the airfield in preparation to relieve Edson on the 14th and to be ready to reinforce his line. Late in the afternoon, Colonel Edson stepped onto a grenade box and addressed his exhausted Marines. You men have done a great job and I have just one more thing to ask of you. Hold out just one more night. I know you've been without sleep a long time, but we expect another attack from them tonight and they may come through here. I have every reason to believe that we will have relief here for all of us in the morning. Edson's pep talk raised the spirits of the raiders and helped them prepare mentally for the night ahead. At 18.30, the Japanese began their attack. They initially surged through a 200-yard gap between two Marine companies. At 2100, the 105s opened up and dropped a barrage at the south end of the ridge. Thirty minutes later, the howitzers laid down a second barrage within 200 yards of the front lines as the Japanese tide began to roll up the ridge. By 2200, a full battalion of 105mm howitzers were dropping rounds in front of the Marine lines, getting too close for comfort. At 2230, the Japanese hit the Marines in force. Company B of the parachutist was subjected to an intense mortar barrage and then assaulted by a wave of infantrymen who came lunging out of the jungle with blood-curdling screams of bonsai. The weight of the attack fell on Company B of the raiders, who only had 60 marines left standing. Edson ordered Company B to fall back. Companies B and C of the parachutists also began falling back. A withdrawal at night in the face of an enemy attack ranks among the most difficult maneuvers in war. It is intrinsically confusing and even with fresh men difficult to control. Some of the Marines thought they heard the word withdrawal and began pulling back. That order was never given. This nearly started a rout with the possibility that the Marine lines might start unraveling. At this point, Major Ken Bailey stepped in and made his appearance known. His commanding presence and vivid language jerked the retreat up short. After the pullback, there were only about 300 Marines in a horseshoe-shaped defensive position that was all that stood between the Japanese and Henderson Field. During the withdrawal to Hill 2, Edson continued to move the defensive artillery barrage closer and closer, but still the Japanese came. In fierce fighting, the Marines held the line while allowing the artillery to cut the Japanese to pieces. The battle deteriorated into hand-to-hand -hand fighting. The situation was critical. Under cover of the artillery barrage, the Marines began to pull back toward the airfield. It was the artillery that made the withdrawal possible as round after round slammed into the advancing Japanese. The Japanese were massacred. It was the artillery that won the Battle of Bloody Ridge. Marine casualties included nearly 60 KIA. Of the nearly 3,000 Japanese who hit the Marine lines during the nights of September 12th and 13th, they suffered the loss of between 700 and 850 KIA and nearly 500 wounded in action, many of who died of their wounds. The surviving Japanese withdrew and began to retreat into the jungle. Many of these survivors were eventually hunted down and killed by Marine patrols. For his gallant and exceptional leadership during the Battle of Bloody Ridge, Major Ken Bailey was awarded the Medal of Honor. Unfortunately, 
He never lived to receive it. He was killed in action on September 26, 1942, leading his men in combat along the Matanikau River. He received his Medal of Honor posthumously and is buried in Spring Hill Cemetery in Danville, Illinois. The Battle of Henderson Field, also known as the Battle of Coffin Corner, was the third and final attempt by the Japanese to retake Henderson Field. After the Battle of Bloody Ridge, it was clear to General Vandegrift that reinforcements were needed. Elements of the 7th Marines, the 3rd Infantry Regiment of the 1st Marine Division, and the 23rd Infantry Division of the U.S. Army, also known as the Americal Division, were ordered to Guadalcanal. With the addition of these units, General Vandegrift finally had enough men to form a cordon defense. He placed the 1st Battalion, 7th Marines, in the jungle immediately east of Bloody Ridge. Two battalions of the 164th Regiment of the Americal Division were deployed to defend the sector of the perimeter from the coast along the Elu River to the jungle next to the 1st Battalion, 7th Marines. Here is a map drawn during the war that indicates the disposition of units and weapons in the southeastern part of the Marine perimeter. This is the general location of the three companies of the 1st Battalion, 7th Marines deployed along each side of Bloody Ridge and into the jungle. The 2nd Battalion, 164th Regiment is deployed along the perimeter extending the line from 1-7 to the Elu River and the coast. 37mm anti-tank guns loaded with canister are arrayed in lines alternating with 50 caliber machine guns. This is where John Baslin was located with his 30 caliber machine gun. The Japanese will hit the perimeter from the south. Colonel Chesty Puller, commanding the 1st Battalion, 7th Marines, placed an observation post 300 yards in front of the Marine lines and directly in the path of the Japanese 129th Infantry. This observation post was under the command of Platoon Sergeant Ralph Briggs. Late in the evening on October 24th, Briggs reported by telephone to Colonel Puller that there are Japs by the thousands coming around both sides of this knoll. Word quickly spread through the lines and Marines tumbled from their foxholes, instantly awake. Fortunately for Briggs and his men, it was raining heavily. The rain covered their withdrawal and they moved east and eventually made it back to the Marine lines. Of the 46 men in Briggs's platoon, 33 made it back the next day. Of the remaining 13, nine would eventually return, the last a two full weeks later. Four were never found and are still MIA. This is another map of the disposition of the combatants on the night of October 24th and 25th. Colonel Puller commanded the 1st Battalion, 7th Marines, who defended the part of the front from Bloody Ridge to what later became known as Coffin Corner. The 2nd Battalion, 164th Regiment, defended the front from Coffin Corner to the mouth of the Elu River. The sector of the perimeter facing the main Japanese point of attack was defended by only one battalion, the 1st Battalion, 7th Marines. That first night of the battle, they would face nine Japanese battalions. The Marine line was tissue thin. During the battle that night, Kawaguchi fed his men as they arrived at the point of contact. The Japanese crept up to the lines, then charged forward, yelling and screaming. The Marines made good use of machine guns and 37mm fire and cut down the Japanese by the hundreds. Puller also called in the artillery. At one point, John Baslin sent a detail out to flatten the mounds of Japanese corpses that were obstructing his field of fire. During the battle of the 3rd Battalion 164th Infantry was fed into the Marine lines to reinforce the position. Throughout the day of October 25th, the Marines redeployed and improved their defenses against the Japanese attack they expected that night. By now, the Marines and the soldiers of the 164th Americal Regiment were intermingled and sharing foxholes side by side. The Division Reserve the 3rd Battalion, 2nd Marines, was placed directly behind the lines. 
the Japanese committed the Reserve 16th Infantry to the attack in the early morning hours of October 26th, the 16th Infantry made numerous unsuccessful frontal assaults on the American lines. Marine and Army rifle, machine gun, mortar, artillery, and direct canister fire from 37mm anti-tank guns tore into the Japanese, cutting down hundreds. This was the scene the morning after the battle in front of the Marine lines. The first rays of light revealed the outcome of the all-night battle. Some Japanese managed to breach the Marine line and push a hundred yards into Polar 7th Marines. Throughout the morning, Marine patrols eliminated the brief Japanese toehold. The rest of the Japanese who infiltrated the lines during the night were scattered in small, isolated pockets. Marine patrols killed 67 of the infiltrators during the day to add to the toll piled along the wire. At least 300 Japanese fell on the wire or within the perimeter. The marine artillery and mortars claimed more victims beyond the perimeter. For his action that night, John Bazelon earned the Medal of Honor. He was killed on D-Day at Iwo Jima, February 19, 1945, and is buried in Arlington National Cemetery. During the same night that John Bazelon earned his medal, Sergeant Mitch Page earned his. His H Company was supporting Marines from the 2nd Battalion, 7th Marines, on a coral ridge near Hill 67. This is where Colonel Oka was to attack the perimeter. Page's platoon arrived on the ridge on the night of October 24th. During the night, Page crawled to where he thought was at the very front or south part of the ridge. Here is a map and an overhead photo of the coral ridge east of the Matanikau where this action took place. Sergeant Page could hear Japanese whispering just in front of him. Not wanting to give his position away with gunfire, he tossed a few grenades against what he thought was a patrol probing the line. Screams were heard and two dead Japanese were found the next morning. At 0200, October 25th, while the battle raged at Coffin Corner, the Japanese attacked Page's position in force and their superior numbers began to overrun the position. Page ran from machine gun to machine gun, rallying his men while he also fired at the charging Japanese. The continued Japanese attacks eventually passed his position and he found himself firing at them from behind their advance. After the battle was over, many of the dead Japanese were found to have been hit in the back and in the soles of their feet, all from Page's machine gun. At dawn, Page made his legendary charge at the Japanese, firing his 30 caliber water-cooled machine gun from the hip. This charge drove the Japanese from the ridge and earned him the Medal of Honor. In the Battle of Henderson Field, or Coffin Corner, the Marines lost as many as 68 KIA and the Japanese as many as 3,000. It was another disaster for the Imperial Japanese Army. This lecture will continue in Part 4 of the Battle of Guadalcanal.